Recalling from the bending stress main video two videos ago and linked in the description of this video, we had defined the bending strain as y over rho, where y is the distance from the neutral axis of a bent beam and rho the radius of curvature. The radius of curvature for any function y of x is written as 1 minus y prime squared to the 3 over 2 over y double prime. A link to a one and a half minute proof for this expression is in the description below if you're interested. For any beam that is being deformed by point loads, distributed loads, couples, any combination of external or reaction loads, y prime, which is the derivative of y and therefore the slope of the beam, is very, very small. If we take a very small value and square it, it will be even smaller, practically zero. One to the three over two is still one, and therefore minus y over strain is one over y double prime. We already knew that the elastic modulus times the strain is equal to the stress, so if we substitute the strain by sigma over e, and then sigma by the bending stress expression, we see that y double prime is equal to m over ei. The moment is of course a function of x, since it changes as we move along the x-axis of the beam. This is the reason we draw bending moment diagrams. This means that y double prime is also a function of x. This expression is very important to calculate deflections. If we know that we can find the second derivative, if we can write the moment as a function of x, we can integrate once to find the slope of the beam at any point along its axis, and integrate one more time to find its deflection. Again, at any point along its axis x. Now, remember that the moment is the integral of the shear, and that the shear is the integral of the distributed load. A link to this proof is found in the description below. With these relationships, we can conclude that to find the slope or the deflection of a beam at any point along the axis, we have to begin by writing the distributed load function wx, integrate once to find vx, integrate again to find mx, integrate yet again to find the slope function, with the elastic modulus and the second moment of area information, of course, and one more time to find the deflection. These integrals will, of course, have integration constants associated to them. From the distributed load integration to find the shear force V as a function of x, we see that the integration constants are just the external and reaction shear loads. So after integrating W of x, we add all the point loads we see on the beam, external or reaction. The same is true for the integration of the shear load function v. The integration constants will be the external couples, including the reaction moments that originate at, for example, the wall of a cantilever beam. Remember that what we plot in the shear diagrams is the forces up to the cut, and not the reaction force at the cut. So for the point loads that you add as the integration constants to the shear function vx, Forces going up are positive, and forces going down are negative. On the other hand, what we plot on the bending moment diagrams is in fact the internal moment, which means the reaction moment at any point along the x-axis. Therefore, a counterclockwise and therefore positive external couple will cause a clockwise and therefore negative reaction at the cut immediately after passing by the external couple. For this reason, the bending moment function of x, m of x, will have integration constants coming from the integration of vx that correspond to the external couples, including their reaction moments. Counterclockwise slash positive external moments will cause clockwise slash negative reactions and therefore these values are subtracted in mx. And on the contrary, clockwise slash negative external moments will cause counterclockwise positive reactions that are therefore added with positive signs to m of x. Finally, we will call the integration constants from m of x to the slope function theta of x c1, and we'll call the integration constant from theta of x to the deflection of x c2. To find the values of c1 and c2, we use what we call boundary conditions. These boundary conditions are just known values for either slopes or deflections along the beam, depending on the type of supports we have. For example, a cantilever beam attached to the left wall means that the beam at x equal to zero cannot deflect, which means y equal to zero. At the wall, it cannot rotate either, since it's not a hinge or a fulcrum, meaning the slope is also zero. 
If the wall is on the right instead, the same y and theta values are true, but in this case, for x equal to whatever the length of the beam is, since we always use the left side as x equal to 0, to keep consistency of the axis positive directions. Other supports, like pin connectors, allow the member to freely rotate. The reaction forces at the pin connector will prevent it from moving in any direction, including y. For this reason, the boundary condition we get at the pin connector location is that y is equal to 0. And this is true for whatever value of x we have to get to the pin connector location. So for example, if the distance from the left to the support is a, we would say at x equal to a, y is equal to 0. To learn more about all the possible boundary conditions, make sure to watch the 2 minute long example videos linked in the description of this video. Now, how do we write these equations for w, v, m, theta, and y? Most of these functions have discontinuities in them, so it makes sense to use step functions. Just be aware that your instructor might use a different method. We call this method the use of singularity functions since a singularity is a point at which a function doesn't have a derivative. And they're basically just a combination of step functions to describe the entire function. From basic math, the triangular brackets of x to the zero exponent means that if x is negative or zero, the function is zero. And if x is a positive value, the function is anything to the zero, which is one. The plot of this step function can be shifted left or right by adding or subtracting a constant value from x. For x minus a to the zero, the same rules apply. If what's inside the brackets is negative, the function is zero, and if what is inside the brackets is positive, the function is one. This means that if x is less than a, g is zero, and if x is greater than a, g is one. Additionally, and again from basic algebra, if we want the function not to be just 0 or 1, but 0 or any amplitude w, we can multiply the brackets by w. This way, the function doesn't go from 0 to 1, but from 0 to w. You can already imagine how this is helpful for distributed loads. If we have a distributed load of 4 kip per foot starting at 3 feet from the left, we would write w of x, the distributed load function, as a step function that begins at 3 and that has a magnitude of 4 kip per foot. Notice that the distributed load for x equal to 1 is 0. Since x minus 3 is 1 minus 3 for x equal to 1, which results in a minus 2 within the brackets, the step function is 0, since for anything that is negative within the brackets, the function will be 0. Now if the distributed load is only applied between foot 3 and foot 9, and the beam is 12 feet long, we can add two step functions together to describe this distributed load. The first one is still the same one, with a positive 4 magnitude and beginning at x equal to 3, and the second one has a minus 4 magnitude and begins at x equal to 9 feet. Graphically, this makes sense. The positive and the negative functions will result in what we were given, as for the x equal to 9 feet forward, the distributed loads cancel each other out. The last thing to know is that the singularity functions are integrated normally after the zero exponent. For brackets to the zero, their integral will be the same brackets with a one as the exponent. After that, just integrate normally as if the brackets were the variable x. For example, the integral of eight x minus five squared would just be eight over three x minus five cubed. And of course, you keep the triangular brackets. Let's put everything we've learned today to use with a simple, easy example, and for more examples with different boundary conditions and different external loads, including triangular distributed loads and external couples, make sure to check out the links to the short example videos in the description below. For the beam and loading shown, and knowing the values for the elastic modulus and the second moment of area, what is the slope of the beam at support A, and what is the deflection of the beam at C? Remember to try this problem on your own before continuing to watch the solution in this video. Since the singularity functions we'll use to find a function that describes the slope and the deflection will begin from left to right, we need to find the reaction force at A. We won't be needing the reaction force at B. With a quick free body diagram and a sum of moments about B, and substituting the distributed load by a point load, which has a magnitude of WA, and is located at 5 meters from B, we find that the reaction at A is equal to 5 over 6 WA. 
This point load is important because it'll be part of the constants that we need to add after integrating the distributed load W. For the distributed load equation Wx, we see that there's a negative W that begins at 0 and ends at A, meaning that the second distributed step function needs to counteract that magnitude to cancel out the distributed load with a magnitude of its own as positive W. The shear function v of x will be the integral of these terms plus the external point loads including the reaction forces as the integration constant. There's a positive ay at x equal to 0 and a positive by at x equal to l. But since the domain, meaning the values that x can take, go from 0 to l, the bracket x minus l will always be 0, following what we learned about step functions today. This means that that last term shouldn't even be written, and that's why we didn't need the reaction force at B. Notice that an x minus 0 within the brackets is just the same as an x alone within the brackets. And since x to the 0 is always 1, because x cannot be a negative value, otherwise we would be outside the beam, the first term can be just written as minus w. The integral of minus w with respect to x is just x, which is also consistent with what we had. The function for the moment m of x will again be the integral of v of x plus the integration constant, but in this case, since there are no external couples or reaction moments, those integration constants are zero. With m over ei being the second derivative of y, the function for y prime, the slope, theta of x times ei will be the integral of m of x. Integrating all terms and remembering to simplify what we can simplify up to this point, we see that we need to add the integration constants, which for theta of x is just c1. Integrating for the last time and adding the second integration constant, we find the expression for y of x times ei. With this expression, we can go back to identifying the boundary conditions. The first boundary condition at A, meaning x equal to 0, is that the beam cannot go up or down, meaning y is 0. The second boundary condition at B, meaning x equal to L, or what is the same 3A, is that the beam cannot deflect up or down, meaning y is also equal to 0. With the first boundary condition in the last expression, which means substituting x for 0 and y for 0, we see that some terms are just 0, including the ones where the triangular brackets have a negative value within it, which means the function is 0. This just means that c2 is equal to 0. Using the second boundary condition in that same expression, and this time without c2, since we already know it's 0, means substituting x with 3a and y of x with 0. Solving for c1 from this expression, and substituting the values for w, a, and ay, we find the value for constant c1. With the value for c1 now known, we can find the information we were looking for. The slope at a, meaning theta for x equal to 0, results in a minus 8.18 times 10 to the minus 3 radians, and the deflection at c, which means at x equal to a, or 2 meters, means substituting the values in the function for the deflection y of x, which yields 11.78 millimeters. For more examples on beam deflections and the other videos of the Mechanics of Materials course, make sure to check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.